Hello, my name is Tamar Friedman. I'm the Director of Peer Programs at Jewish Funders Network, and I'm happy to welcome you to today's briefing on poverty and the impact of COVID-19. This webinar is part of a series hosted by the National Affinity Group on Jewish Poverty. The National Affinity Group on Jewish Poverty is a collaborative of funders, Jewish federations, direct service providers, researchers, media outlets, and advocates dedicated to fighting poverty in the American Jewish community. During all these briefings, we've discussed the many challenges the coronavirus pandemic has created for Jews facing poverty and the agencies that serve them. We hear the needs from the service providers on the ground supporting our front lines, share best practices and information, and strategize on the ways to best respond collectively. Today, we are very fortunate to have the opportunity to hear from the leaders of the Jews of Color Initiative COVID-19 Emergency Relief Fund, and they're all, we're going to hear a wonderful present and informative presentations from them, and then we'll be able to ask some questions using the Q&A box on the bottom of your screen. And now I will hand it over to Susan Ditkoff of the Greens, Greenspan Group Boston, who will help introduce today's speakers and give some words of, of framing and introduction. Thank you, Susan. Good. Thank you so much, Tamar. And good morning, everyone, or good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you are. Um, welcome to this, um, which is the fourth installment in our series of briefings, as Tamar said. Um, our first two webinars focus on specific sectors, um, food, housing, uh, mental health, aging, um, and our last webinar and today focus on more systemic issues. Uh, our last webinar was focused on the role of government, um, and today we're going to be talking about the disproportionate impact um, that the COVID crisis is having on Jews of color in our community. Um, all of the prior webinars and then this one will be available on the uh, Jewish Funders Network website. Um, so today our session leaders are going to provide um, a few things. Um, first, uh, an overview of the needs um, of our vulnerable community members who are Jews of color and Jewish, communities, Jewish communal professionals of color. Um, also important gaps and services that have been identified uh, being pro provided to Jews of color in the community by the current agencies and structures. And they'll show their experiences from the initial rounds of the Emergency Relief Fund and highlight lessons learned for how the Jewish community um, needs to and can better support um, Jews of color moving forward. So we are looking forward to um, turning it over to, um, I'll turn it over to Alana Kaufman, who is the Executive Director of the Jews of Color Field Building Initiative, um, who will frame our session um, and give us opening remarks. Um, we will then have Angel Alvarez Mapp, who's the Director of Programs and Operations at the Jews of Color Initiative, and Jenna Green, who's the former Chief Strategy Officer at Ben the Ark. Um, I also want to thank um, Paula Pretlow, who um, from the uh, Harry and Jeanette Weinberg Foundation, who was so critical in helping us think through uh, today's session um, and frame it. So thank you, Paula. Um, we're grateful for you. Um, and then the last thing I will say by way of introduction is that the chat and the Q&A will be open and at about half past the hour, we will start to um, bring comments or questions into the conversation. So with that, Alana, thank you so much for agreeing to lead today's session and I'm delighted to turn the mic over to you. Right on, great. Thanks so much and good morning or good afternoon or good evening to everybody out there. And I'm just really delighted to be able to have this conversation. Thank you to Jewish Funders Network. Thank you, thank you to the Harry and Jeanette Weinberg Foundation and thank you to Angel and Gina for being this great team to both do this work with the fund and to have this conversation. So I wanna start off by just kind of setting the context and telling some story if that's okay. Um, when the COVID-19 crisis hit the United States, we at the Jews of Color Initiative had an, um, an inkling that the patterns of impact for communities of color around the country would layer over um, the pattern of impact for Jews of color. So we had some hypotheses. We also were um, getting emails and communications from our colleagues out there, really wondering like, how do we match Jews of color who are expressing need with Jewish communal services that were already available? We knew we had partners and colleagues out there from Hebrew Free Loan Associations, from Jewish Family Children's or Community Services, from federations who were offering substantial support for community members who were affected by the virus. And so we thought that the, 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 the challenge in front of us was just how to align the, the resources with the needs out there. 
We also started to get some feedback from our partners at Dimensions who've been doing an amazing job of doing a landscape analysis of the impact of COVID-19 on Jews of color in particular. We started to get some feedback that there were headwinds in terms of access to the funds. There were headwinds in terms of awareness about the resources that were available. There were headwinds in terms of the experience Jews of color were having when trying to access those resources around whether or not um, the staff, quite frankly, who they were interacting with had cultural competency training or were um, uh, reinforcing dynamics of racism that were already being felt by those affected by COVID-19 and already living their lives as Jews of color. So anyway, in this moment, we were, all, we're always trying to figure out what we at the initiative can do to create more landscape, to create more foundation, to create more infrastructure of support. Again, thinking that the challenge in front of us was to align resources that were already available with community members who needed them. We slowly started to get um, some funds coming in to be turned into grants for emergency relief. We started to provide some emergency relief uh, grants to Jewish organizations led by Jews of color, serving Jews of color, so that they could make sure that their personnel were intact and that their organizations could continue to operate. And again, we started to conti we continue to get this feedback that Jews of color were in need. We at that point received a grant of about $100,000 to apply just for emergency relief for individuals in the Jewish community. And very much in our style, we, we anticipated being able to um, find a partner out there, create a structure, and make sure that Jews of color had access to these resources with some real speed given the urgency of the situation, given the vulnerability Jews of color were experiencing again, um, the headwinds of racism, the headwinds of being in urban environments, all of those pieces not only affect people of color in general in the United States, but as Jews of color are simply a subset of people of color in the United States, those patterns are parallel. As I started to call Hebrew Free Loans, to call Jewish Family Children's Services, to call Federation colleagues out there and ask them, where can we put this $100,000 um, so that we had one central location for Jews of color to contact, to fill out an application, to receive some social services support. Again, there's an abundance of support in the Jewish community. What we found was there was no one location where I could park the money, where we could put the funds for allocations. And what we learned was in the spirit of how the federation system has been set up in a largely disaggregated way, where there's a loose network of organizations and entities around the country who somehow do the same thing or loosely collaborate with each other. This disaggregated nature of our, of our Jewish communal uh, social, social services structure means that when there is one vulnerable group who needs support and services, there's no one location to align that group with need with services. So that really um, set us back for a moment, understanding that if we were going to create a fund and um, create an opportunity and a platform for relief, it probably was not going to be in a Jewish communal entity, which was very dramatic for us to think about it, as you can imagine, because here we are in a context where there's all this support, all this good intention, all these great professionals out there, but there's nowhere to align the need with the support. Very much in our own fashion, we decided since we couldn't find anywhere to partner with us um, to be able to create one portal um, for access for the, for the community of Jews of color in need, we decided to start our own fund. That made sense to us. We had all of the capacity to do our own grant making. We have a stellar team. Um, we have all kinds of legal and infrastructural support to make sure that we, we operate within um, what's acceptable practice out there, which was a major learning for us. Um, and we had all the tools to sort of get started. We're a very, very efficient and light on our feet grant making team. And so we just had that can do confidence and maybe a little bit of hubris um, in the sense of why can't we run our own fund? And again, there's all this urgency in terms of need. We got one day away from launching our fund. <laughs> we had created the application. We had created the press release. We had created the grant making committee. Again, the need was building up. We had a, an email file, an email queue of Jews of color in the community who were requesting and seeking resources. So all of the pieces were at play and we hit a legal snag, which was Jews of color in the United States, because the population has been understudied and is not as well known as other vulnerable groups like LGBTQ or immigrant populations, 
Jews of color specifically don't meet the threshold to count as a legally vulnerable population to meet the need for a legally um, supported emergency fund. And so we spent some time with our lawyers really thinking about, again, what is our purpose and our mission? Of course, it's to understand racism inside the Jewish community and outside the Jewish community for, Jew the, for the Jewish community. And so we spent time really thinking about the center of our work and our mission, the need that was presented to us and what the legal options were, which were, um, we could absolutely create a fund that Jews of color could access, but there are also other people of color in the Jewish community who are vulnerable, um, who need support like partners of color of multiracial Jewish families, like the thousands and thousands and thousands of colleagues of color who support our Jewish communal organizations, particularly in areas of service and essential workers who are not eligible for Jewish community resources traditionally, but are certainly part of our community and certainly vulnerable. Um, and so that's, so we ended up creating a legal treatment and a legal framework that allowed us to run and deploy the fund. That's why the language is what it is around Jews of color, people of color in the Jewish community. I actually think that language makes our work better um, and makes our uh, response to racism in the Jewish community uh, finer um, and uh, in, in greater service to the large community because we're able to serve a pretty substantial population of people of color in the Jewish community and Jews of color in the Jewish community who are suffering from COVID and the impacts of COVID. The last thing I'll say before I turn it over to Angel is, as Jewish communal leaders, as Jewish social service organizational experts, thinkers, leaders, doers, plan for our present and plan for our communal future, what we've learned from this process is that as we have new emerging vulnerable populations, which we will, we will always have new emerging vulnerable populations, we don't have the infrastructure right now to problem solve how to serve those populations in a networked way. We don't have an infrastructure to have meta communal conversations and we don't have any entity where we can move solutions forward in a way that will serve the national community. And so I think there's just an important piece for us all to take away, which is Jews of color represent one vulnerable population. There will be new populations and more just as we evolve over time. And how do we plan for these moments where we're going to have to bring communal services to new populations in the context where we're absent of the network to do so? So anyway, thank you. And Angel, what happened next? Thanks, Alana. Um, so what happened next? We launched uh, the application not really having, I mean, having a, a general understanding of how m of the, the quantity of applications we expected, but we didn't, I think, really understand the, the magnitude of it. And so for those of us who are visual learners, I'm going to actually share a slide with us real quick. Um, so, so far to date, the initiative has given out $94,525 in emergency funds. Um, and the emergency funds are, range anywhere from $250 to uh, $2,500. This number uh, equals 47 individual awards made. Um, this afternoon, actually, uh, Gina and, and Alana and I have a couple more to review. Um, we know that of these 47 folks, at least four of them are self-identified Jewish communal professionals. Um, and I'll come back to that in just a moment. Um, and then fascinating, fascinatingly, the areas of, of concentration are pretty, I mean, I think a lot of us would say, of course, New York, San Francisco, Los Angeles would see a lot of need because the Jewish communities there are larger, but then we have 9% of our applicants are from uh, the Baltimore area, 6% are from North Carolina. Um, and then I loved seeing somebody from Sacramento, mostly because that's like my hometown. Uh, and so we've sort of noticed that geographically we actually have some diversity and it's not just the, the coast as, as usual. Um, and now I'll go into some of the reasons uh, for, for need, just to give us a little context of the folks that were applying. Um, there was one, uh, this happened to be a Jewish professional uh, in New York um, who says, my husband and I need to figure out which meals we're going to skip this week so that we can afford to live and pay our bills and still survive. Uh, there is a person of color, so not a Jew, um, who has worked for a summer camp for 10 years. Uh, 
was significantly furloughed, um, had their pay cut. Their husband is a dis, uh, disabled veteran. Uh, they came to us because nobody in the Jewish community was willing to offer them any support, even though they've worked in one of, at one of our summer camps for 10 years. Uh, another applicant um, is seven months pregnant, was just laid off, also a Jewish communal professional, uh, and is now two months behind in rent. Uh, and then we've seen a number of applicants come in with uh, medical needs because, you know, most of us get our be medical benefits through our employer. And what happens when you get laid off? Your medical benefits go away. And so we actually have an applicant this afternoon who is trying to figure out how to pay for their migraine injections because they need severe uh, migraine help. And so those were some of the reasons for why folks needed, uh, needed um, relief. And one thing that quickly became apparent to Ilana and I at least was that we needed to start seeing why, like ask some follow-up questions, but keep it really minimal because we didn't, it's hard enough for people to come to us and say, I need help. Um, but we wanted to ask two follow-up questions. Once we uh, notified everyone that they were um, accepted, that their application was accepted, we asked two questions. Were you aware of Jewish community resources in your region? And if you were, why did you or did you not apply? Um, two people were aware of resources in their regions. Um, but one reason was they didn't trust the system that was in place to keep their confidentiality. Uh, the other one was afraid to apply to a major federation in this country because they didn't identify as a Zionist and they felt that the federation would not want to support them. The overwhelming number of our applicants did not know of resources in their regions. And this includes people in Los Angeles, in New York, and in San Francisco, where we all are well, well aware that there are a number of resources. Um, and I'm actually going to stop sharing my screen here because now I'm just looking at the screen instead of everybody else. I think um, that we received a follow-up from one of our applicants. So they applied for us in the very, very first week of the fund. Um, they received their check in about two weeks and they came back to us later to sort of give us feedback of this other process that they were experiencing. And I'm not gonna call anybody out because that's not our style, but there's another federation in the US that just launched an emergency fund at the beginning of June. Uh, this applicant is a senior, 75 years old. Uh, he and his wife obviously are suffering some, some loss of income right now and need, need support. So they applied on June 5th, the date that the application opened. A week later, they were notified that their application had been received. So now they're like, okay, so this is nice, but like, how is that helpful? A week after that, they were asked for more proof of why they actually needed um, assistance. A week after that, mind you, they've already been told their application was received and they might get some money. A week after that, they were asked for further information about why they needed um, assistance. So far, it's been five weeks since they applied to their local federation and they have yet to receive any relief. And I think a lot of us would say, if this is emergency relief, how how is it that it takes five weeks to help somebody financially? Um, and the other uh, last bit I'll add to their story is that their federation application had 80 questions to answer. And the reason I point that out is because for, for us, our application, Ilana and I thought it was already a little long. And I think we might hover at 10 questions because our work isn't to second guess somebody and, and, and wonder if they actually need the support. If you're coming to us, we assume that you have already gone through your soul searching. You are the expert of your own finances. It's not for us to sit here and say, well, I don't know, like, can you send me another bill or can you send me another receipt? And that's been an interesting moment to see how our application has drawn in larger numbers of Jews of color because the, the more um, traditional systems are so cumbersome and require so much more, so much more work, so much more proof. Um, it, it's, it's been a lot of learning and fascinating. Um, and with that, I'll pass it over to Gina. Thank you, Angel. Thank you, Alana. And thank you, Susan and Tamar. 
uh, for convening this conversation and for inviting me to be a part of it. And I wanna thank you for inviting me to be a part of this process um, to work with you and Angel on this very timely and important piece of work. Um, like Alana pointed out just a few moments ago, in the lead up to this, this piece of work um, the initiative has been doing, we were already aware that we, would, we were going to see the headwinds of racism, of predominantly urban environment and urban livings among, and among Jews of color and people of color, that we were going to see have an impact on what we would then, which would then be the applications coming in. And so certainly what we have seen has been a sort of laying bare the degree of financial need due to COVID-19 for people of color and Jews of color in our community. But what I think is really important for us to recognize and just to underscore Alana's earlier point is that the, the realities that created this situation actually predate the situation itself, right? So we are experiencing, and Jews of color and people of color in our community are experiencing these challenges against the backdrop of racism and all of the inherent challenges that are associated with that and make life living for people of color and for Jews of color. And so what I found incredibly interesting about um, this process and this quite painful work actually to go through and, you know, I'm kind of surprised, Angel, that anybody wants to ask 80 questions that are just so hard to ask and so hard to get the answers from. That's really mind boggling to me. But our Jewish community is diverse, not just racially and ethnically, but we're dealing with a population that is people of color and Jews of color. And even within that, we saw tremendous diversity across geography, across class, across gender, sexual orientation. So I just want to like lift up that our Jewish community is multiracial, multiethnic, and diverse in so many ways. And even as we are dealing with and looking at and supporting people of color in our community, we are also diverse in all the ways that America is diverse too. So that's one piece that I think is really important for us to walk away from. I'll just dig in a little bit more on some of the pieces that um, Angel lifted up in particular around this geographic concentration, right? We would have expected to see what we saw in terms of the San Francisco and the New Yorks and the LA, right? But we also got multiple applications from the Midwest and significant from the South. And so on the one hand in New York, LA and San Francisco, <laughs> okay, these are places where folks should have been able to have access, accessibility and awareness of funds that are available. And yet there was some disconnect in either folks' ability or willingness to engage with the community that was offering it. And then also looking at the South, the Mid-Atlantic and the Midwest, I think this underscores even further that our Jewish community is so diverse in many ways and serving us all means actually looking beyond those population centers and the conventional wisdom that all Jews live in these places. We don't, um, and it's really important, and this I think goes back to Alana's point about how the only way to really do this work was for, <laughs> there wasn't a centralized national place for us to do something that looks like this. And at the same time, I think what we're seeing is <laughs> more than ever, we need that. We need a way for there to be a network um, approach to reaching and meeting the needs of everyone in our community. The other piece that Angel also mentioned about Jewish communal professionals and how many folks, how many applications we read of people who were former or current Federation staff or JCC staff or just general communal organization staff. What, and this is requiring us to do a little bit of forensics analysis in a little bit of a way, what was our situation like before March, before COVID, that created a situation where some people are going to be more vulnerable, more at risk, than others. What is our structure of employment compensation? Who was doing the work, that essential work? Who was doing it? How are they getting paid? I think we have to look at that. And it has to be part of the analysis of what it means to actually serve not just our Jewish community, but the people who serve our Jewish community as well. And I think with I'll wrap up and just ask a question, which is, what does it say that in our nation's major metropolitan areas, in our communities, in our communal organizations, that social workers, program managers, cantors, these are all people 
who submitted applications to us are all in dire relief and in dire need of this relief from this fund. One, it says that the people of color and JOCs lack the access, awareness, and sometimes have a discomfort with major city resources that should be available and that we know are. Any three of these, whether it be access, awareness, or discomfort, are problematic <laughs> and means that we must actually do better not just communicating to POC and JOC communities, but also communicating with and engaging with and being in community with these folks. It also says that our Jewish community, that our diverse Jewish community, is not immune to the ills and challenges of an American fabric that's been stitched by racism. Everything that happens to America happens to the Jewish community because we are it and we are as diverse as America itself. So we must hold that reality at all times. And it's just that COVID-19 has put that disparity in even starker relief. And it also says that we really must do the immediate work, the emergent work, the work that should not take five weeks of keeping on lights, keeping food on tables, and keeping roofs overheads. But we also can't not look at the long game. And what does it mean that our structures did not make this easier for us to be more nimble and able to serve our community in our time of need? Um, and with that, I will wrap up and pass it back to Alana. Susan, do you wanna feel any questions or how would you like to start? Um, sure. <clears throat> um, so first of all, thank you, um, Alana, Angel, Jen. This is just a fantastic um, sort of overview of, um, I think, things that need to be um, more highlighted, more well-known um, than they are. I think they're known in certain communities and, and not known in others. So I think this communication and visibility and daylighting is just so important. So thank you for, for doing that every day and, and, and here especially. Um, there are a couple of questions in the chat, which I thought we maybe would want to start with. Um, one question is about um, how this initiative is being marketed nationally um, and what the, I think you addressed some of this, but the average amount of assistance provided and how people have received the help to date, how many people and what kind of help. Sure, so, so maybe I'll start a little bit, there? maybe I'll start with a little bit with the marketing approach and then Angel, will you um, come in with some of those numbers and details? Um, we thought long and hard about how to market this because when we started to get calls and inquiries from colleagues and it was really like one call and then an email and then I'd get a text message from like a rabbinic colleague who is working with a colleague of color out there. Um, they were coming, the very first set of calls were coming from regions where we knew there were already services in place. And so that made us wonder about, um, first of all, if it's if, if 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 Jews of color and colleagues of color in the Jewish community are not hearing about resources available in major metropolitan areas, there's something about the Jewish community media communication that's not working well. And so we looked at the, the communication that was coming out of federations and Hebrew Free Loan Associations, not with a criticism, but with a critique of if people in New York City don't know these resources available, then there's a communication gap there and we need to, we need to move around that, that part of the gap. And so we actually decided to create a, a marketing approach, and this was like not a major campaign, but you know, a small marketing approach that looked at both Jewish and secular media outlets um, particularly in major metropolitan areas where there are large populations of, of communities of color and to approach it that way. We also, thanks to Ricky Robinson in our office, went on a very grassroots reach out approach and targeted um, and focused on, I think, 20 social media spaces dedicated to Jewish people of color. We used our JOC colleagues and allies out there to do a grass work, grassroots spreading of the communication. And then we literally, we all had a little bit of a text message campaign where it was really word, word of mouth. And we would talk about the opportunity, inquire about need, and we would get text messages from colleagues sort of saying, how do, you, how do we match a person with the opportunity? And so we use non-traditional Jewish communal tools like secular media, like social media in a very targeted Jews of color specific way. Um, and then word of mouth and grassroots organizing to make sure that the communication got to the people. And to answer the, the numbers, we did, um, so far we've done 47 awards and that averages out to about $2,000 per, per folks. 
uh, per person, knowing full well that since the range is 250 to $2,500, we have had a number of people apply for literally like $554 because there's a specific bill that they know they have to pay. Um, so, yeah. Great. Uh, there's one more question in the chat. Um, did you ask if the recipients were aware and had applied to secular resources in their communities, such as cash assistance funds set aside by United Ways or community foundations or state or city funds, or profession-specific funds um, like those set up for essential workers and artists? So I think it's a, just an interesting question about sort of the ecosystem, um, perhaps. Yeah, um, we did not ask about whether or not they had tried to tap non Jewish resources that were available. We asked about Jewish resources in specific. Anecdotally, some told us about their outreach. And overall, these are folks who um, did not view themselves as having significant access to those communal resources, whether they be secular or Jewish. And so they had used their grassroots resources out there. There was a lot of collaboration. There were people who were working together to try to resolve financial problems and financial stresses. Um, but they, uh, overall, we were probably one of, if not the only fund, most of these applicants um, reached out to, to leverage resources. Well, and I'll also just add that um, we know anecdotally a number of them have said that they have applied for like, let's say unemployment, for instance, and wherever they are, it's just taking too long to hear back from, from that entity. So they're, they're sort of on this, I'm about to be evicted and I don't know when unemployment's gonna actually happen. So we do know some of that, but we, we haven't specifically asked um, those questions. May I jump in? I, I, I also feel like this is um, this question and the answer also shed a little bit of light on just, I think, broader Jewish community and just in general, like how people are positioned to ask for money and discomfort with <laughs> this question of, well, I actually can't pursue more money because then I will get less money. It's like a college financial aid thing, right? The more money you have, the less you get. And so I think there's like a little, some per perverse disincentivizing of actually having people seek resources because it may be that people, if people are asking, they need it. And just to underscore what Angel said earlier, we are not here in the business to police people's own um, understanding of their finances and their own need. And I think that we as just probably not just a Jewish community, but just as an American community, asking um, these questions about, you know, where other money is coming from puts people in an awkward position of not wanting to ask for money for fear for not getting more from someone else. So I just want us to sort of keep that in mind. I think that actually comes through in other um, aspects of philanthropy and community support as well. Great. There are two uh, questions about funding the fund. Um, one is, uh, does it need more resources? Um, and who has contributed to the fund thus far? Are there federations at the table? What's the future of the fund? Um, so maybe just a few questions about that. I love that question, particularly because we never saw ourselves in this situation of, of <laughs> developing and stewarding this fund. Um, the fund started with a $25,000 grant for um, the pilot fund, which was not really a fund, it was a $25,000 grant that we focused on Jewish communal organizations that needed relief immediately. These are GAOC organizations. We then received a $1,000 grant for our first individual um, grant making or funding. These are not technically grants, um, but we received a $1,000 gift for individual COVID relief. That gift turned into a $6,000 gift. And then we received another $100,000. Um, we then received one $50,000 grant from one federation. And so one federation has contributed to the fund. All of the other funding has come from either individual donors or uh, foundations. And um, we offered, we chose when we did the press release and the marketing to not do it as a fundraising campaign. To be very honest, partially because we had not tested our hypothesis of need. And so we had an instinct and a hypothesis of need, but we didn't really know that this, the need was so great. We didn't really know um, that there were gonna be Jewish criminal professionals in the collective. We didn't know that there were gonna be folks who'd been working in like Jewish restaurants for 40 years. 
um, who found themselves out of a job and had dedicated their lives to the Jewish community and now um, were without. Um, and so we didn't know the scale or scope of need. And so since then, there has been a passive fundraising where we've received additional um, gifts to our, our Donate Now button, um, specifically earmarked for the COVID relief. And, um, you know, we have tried to approach the entire process from a, a place of um, abundance, quite honestly. Um, we, have to man we have to create the abundance here at the initiative, but we didn't want people who are already feeling so stressed and so um, that this level of urgency to also feel like we were going to run out of money. And so different than some other funds, we, um, we evaluate applications every Tuesday um, and we will continue to evaluate applications every Tuesday until there are no more applications. We will, um, we, are, we welcome additional funds for uh, COVID relief. We also may repoint some of our own grant making funds if the need continues to be severe. Um, and in the meantime, we're trying to figure out how to get our local federations, Hebrew free loans and so forth to also pick up some of this work with us. The structures are very different. The approaches are very different. We also um, are giving funds. We are not making loans. A loan is a very, very stressful fiscal um, tool or vehicle in a situation like this. And so we are, so we are fundraising. It's been a bit of a passive fundraising to, make, to continue to match need with resources. Um, and we will try to meet the need as long as the need uh, persists. There's a great question here about um, data. So how are you aggregating all of the rich data that you're receiving? What are your plans for using this data to provide for continuing outreach or services for these populations? And I will add on to that a question about sort of the role of national private foundations to helping facilitate this work. Um, Yes, yeah, so there is, um, just like on a really base tactical level, there's a spreadsheet that lives on my current laptop um, where there's all of this information. And the, the, the real, I think after the first round of applications that we reviewed, that was the moment that Alana and I quickly were like, there's going to be some real data here that needs to, needs to be collected and needs to be shared. Um, and I think what we've learned so far um, and how we plan to continue to use this data is to do things like this, this webinar to help educate the funding community, the federation community, and quite frankly, the national Jewish community on what happens to us, i.e. Jews, period, um, in moments of crises. Uh, I think there's a lot of learnings here. I think there's um, some really tough questions that the Jewish community will need to ask itself um, when we have Jewish communal professionals who can't afford to, to live, really. Um, what, what does that mean to us and how do we navigate that and what changes need to happen? So I would say that's sort of the, the main point now to the data is, is sort of saving it, translating it in, in a way that is, is palpable and makes some sense um, and educating the community. Uh, and sorry, Susan, you asked another follow-up so it was the role of philanthropy in helping to support that work. I think Alana, you might want to take that one on. And then I'm gonna and then Gina's gonna take a piece, I'm sure. I mean, there's so many things, colleagues. Like first, the role of philanthropy is to to take this moment and, and understand that in terms of Jews of color and people of color in the Jewish community, we have a very real problem, which is we have a structure that is intentionally disaggregated for a for a time that is past at this point. Um, the disaggregation doesn't serve when we have emerging crises and emerging populations. And so one of the first things we want to raise up is how does philanthropy help um, bring together and convene uh, the network of people who, who are essential in creating some pathway, some set of tools and infrastructure to be able to serve not only Jews of color, but whatever emerging population is coming next that will also be vulnerable and will also be um, at risk and exposed during a crisis, such as a pandemic, such as racism in the United States, such as a climate crisis. And so this is, this is a learning opportunity for us all and to, to the point of the question around data, 
We will use this, you know, in addition to using it now, I mean, this, we hope to create some sort of written piece that will be a tool to leaders to have this conversation. But I would push even a little further and say, for all the foundations, particularly private foundations that fund our communal organizations, this is not a time for criticism because all of the conversations I had with our communal colleagues out there were wonderful. I learned so much about how Hebrew free loans work. I learned so much about how Jewish vocational services work. I had the most incredible conversation with the executive director of Sinai Memorial Chapel in San Francisco. We were trying to understand how to manage burial costs for Jews of color and who counts as a Jew Right, like these deep, deep questions around who counts as a Jew when you want to bury your family member, right? And so the community and the colleagues are incredible. We need to attach our community and our colleagues to some sort of connective fabric that helps people serve the community in times of crisis. And for those philanthropic leaders who are supporting these interventions for vulnerable populations, this is the next question to push. And this is the next question to bring the, the, the thought leaders together to grapple with and problem solve. We know the 140, 130 federated communities are unique. They're distinct. They have their own sizes. They have their own needs. They also map exactly the same to the US population to Gina's point in terms of diversity, in terms of people of color. We had like three or four trans men in our, in our application pool. Right? Like who's serving them? And do you think like their emergency fund is their only need out there? Probably not. These are the same colleagues who are also working in the Jewish community and helping Jewish communal colleagues right now. And so we need like a gentle intervention, again, as a critique and as a way to solve this problem because we must anticipate it happening again, either for Jews of color or other vulnerable populations in the Jewish community. I just one uh, data point to throw. Oh, go, please go ahead, Gina. Just super quickly, I just wanted to say that like, Elena rightfully points out that as we go through life and <laughs> and the future history, like the present and the future, that we will see more emerging populations. And my dad used to say, and it was later popularized also, if you stay ready, you don't have to get ready. And so there's an element of what are our communities set up to do all the time when it's normal and when it's not a crisis and when it isn't a pandemic, so that because when we do when we are built the right way to handle the good times then when the bad times come we are infinitely better prepared to be nimble and responsive and flexible and so i think that even though this pandemic this crisis has laid bare real challenges many of these pre-existed this moment and so our work is twofold is actually to address the here and now and also to put in place the right structures that will allow us to do that all the time and when the next here and now that's crisis comes as well it's such a powerful i love that if you stay ready you don't have to get ready i think that probably should be a banner um, as part of the awareness building campaign um, just on that note i want to pick up on the question of data and philanthropy um, and this relates uh, both to that Dina and alana's opening remarks also about the infrastructure um, just by way of context, uh, my colleagues at the Bridgespan Group, along with Cheryl Dorsey, who's the CEO of Echoing Green, um, created a robust new report on racial inequity in the general nonprofit sector. They were not focusing on the Jewish nonprofit sector. Um, and it really reinforces a lot of the themes um, that, that have been raised, and, and Gina, especially that, which is that these, these problems pre-exist. Um, and so just a couple data points that's helpful. I mean, there are mass, we've talked a lot about the Jews of color as beneficiaries and people of color working in communal organizations as beneficiaries. But the other way to sort of think about it is organizations led by Jews of color um, in leadership positions and, and the funding and disparate impact, disparate funding of those organizations. So just a couple of data points. I mean, it's the, there are massive disparities in revenues um, and unrestricted assets between white-led and black-led organizations in particular in the early stages. So black-led organizations have 24% smaller average revenues and 76% smaller unrestricted net assets, um, which is a huge, um, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a way to think about, it's a proxy for trust in a lot of ways, um, unrestricted net assets. Um, and the gap persists even when taking into account factors like the issue area or the education level of the 
CEO. Um, and so I just really want to think about that question, you know, like what does this need to look like steady state? Because it wasn't, we were having issues, significant issues before COVID and COVID has just opened up even greater disparities. And so when I think about sort of the role of of philanthropy, and I'd just love to hear your thoughts about this. When you think about awareness and disproportionate impacts, it touches on these much broader themes of systemic racism, of representation, of visibility and erasure. I mean, all these other complicated pieces, and this is a, this is a microcosm, it's a flashpoint. Um, it's kind of getting a lot of attention. So as we kind of think about this moment and sort of how this moment might be helpful um, in reframing the debate. I would love to hear the thoughts on, you know, what does that messaging need to look like? What are the kind of, what are the things that people need to be paying attention to? I mean, certainly just the data, understanding the need and the disparate impacts and understanding disparate impacts on organizations led by people of color, both. Um, there are two separate effects, but they're related. Trust, uh, proximity, disaggregation, goals, accountability. There's just there are so many pieces. So I would love advice that you have, um, sort of, as, as we try to sort of think about those broader field effects. Um, Jeanette, I think you were you were kind of alluding to with um, if you're if you're ready, you don't need to. If you're already ready, yeah. you don't need to get ready. No, I'm happy to hop right in, and Angel and Alana can uh, back me up. Um, also, after. George Floyd was murdered in Minneapolis. Um, there was a piece that JTA ran that was featured words from um, Black Jews who were responding to sort of this flashpoint that America was now in, um, in that moment. And I wrote at that point in time about radical possibility and where the Jewish community I felt could go and be in this moment. And I think what's really important for us to recognize there, there's so much wrapped up in what I'm about to say, and I wish we had more time um, to dig really into it. But the reality is that right now in the United States, even though the American Jewish community we know is one that is multiracial, multiethnic, multi-class, all of these things, and diverse as America itself, we also know that we are still mostly white. There is a conventional wisdom that we are mostly well off. And while many Jews are not, and many Jews are not white, many Jews are not well off, many Jews are not white, there is still an element and a degree of power, influence, and resources that as a Jewish community, as a mostly white yet multiracial Jewish community, we hold and that we have. And I believe that in this moment, radical possibility means leaning into what that might mean for our own institutions, our own funders to actually look at those lines. You know, Gamal Palmer from the Federation in LA, he says, is diversity, equity, inclusion, and justice in your budget line? If it's not in your budget line, then is it really real? How are we making our institutions both internally reflect the diversity commitment to inclusion of all of us? And how are we externally as a Jewish community using what is for right now conditional, right? Historically, Jews don't get to be like this, like we are in America for very long before the forces of anti-Semitism make it a lot harder, right? So for right now, American Jews have a lot of power, a lot of resources, influence that we can actually use to deploy to not only transform our community and make us reflective and fully uh, investing in our full diversity, but how do we use that externally to change some of that fabric against that, that we are seeing COVID be laying against a backdrop of, right? We talked about racism and how it infuses and affects everything. So what are we doing as a Jewish community to put resources in different places into Black-led organizations who are pushing the envelope on progress on racial justice and what does that mean internally? I think that as a community, we have to look at both of those buckets, who we are on the inside and how we're using our influence and um, our own resources to change the game on the outside too. Right on, Gina, and I would just add two pieces. One is around the data, which is, I just did like a, a rough um, post-it note back of a napkin calculation. And if we just look at the Jewish communal relief funding, the very formal fund that was created with $91 million in it, 0.0064% 
have gone to Jews of color. If we add in the $136,000 we have granted out that we've raised on our own for COVID relief in the community. If we look at, if we subtract our $136,000, the number goes down to 0.0049%. And so if we just wanna talk about reality and data, we, we must have that calculation inform our understanding of disparity. And so pulling back, how do we also respond to that with Gina's points as a context? I mean, there was an easier way to do this, colleagues, which was instead of having us have to like run and catch up and try to make this all happen. And I just want to say like, we've only, we're only six weeks in, right? Like all of this has happened in the last six weeks we've done this, but we didn't have to do this. We could have used our resources to make grants to build a field for Jews of color, which is um, the focus of how we run our funding. But because nobody went to the decision-making table, because there is no centralized location to use data and reality to inform how we make decisions, we made decisions that didn't serve the vulnerable populations in the community, the extent, the full extent of the vulnerable populations in the community. And so the other alternative would be when a crisis emerges and leaders gather around the table, instead of looking at the room and having that room validate the narrative and the assumptions of who we are, for whom we are in service, not who we are as leaders and decision makers, but for whom we lead and for whom we are in service, until we have a reflexive muscle in place that uses that frame to inform our thinking, we're going to be making all this extra work for ourselves and we're gonna to continue to have to run uphill rather than downhill together. And so when we go to these decision-making tables to have these first conversations, we need to have the data drive the question. Okay, we know 12 to 15% of the US Jewish community are people of color. We know COVID is killing people of color at a twice as fast rate as white folks. Okay, we must center this conversation around Jews of color today and the people of color in our Jewish community because that's the equitable moral thing to do. But instead we forgot about Jews of color at those decision-making tables. And so that's how we operate our structures is we, we reinforce the culture of omission and we call it systemic, but it's really just culture reinforcing the omission. And the alternative is to use the data about the impact of, of women in COVID, particularly those who are um, enduring domestic violence at home. Uh, looking at our black and brown populations and other people of color in the community, looking at people who live in multi-generational houses. This is not to diminish those who are Holocaust survivors or those who are from the former Soviet Union who are also, uh, and our elders who are also vulnerable populations, but the picture is much bigger now. And if we use data, it will inform our picture. And then if we inform our picture, it will inform our work. And that's what we would like to see. Okay, I think we just teed ourselves up for about a six webinar series um, on all these different issues. Um, we have just a few minutes left and I would love to give you three sort of the last word in terms of sort of how you think about this question, this moment, and what are we, as we think about, especially priorities for philanthropists, sort of we've talked about a, a number of different things right now. I think for me, the headline that's sticking in my mind is, if you stay ready, you don't have to get ready. Um, and, and we weren't ready before. Um, and I don't think we even knew how not ready we were um, to a lot of the points you're making about, about data. And so it's just a, it's re, reframing a number of these, of these pieces and, in, and taking more of a field-wide look, um, a, building a strong field, as opposed to one-off um, interventions that are so disaggregated. I just, for me, that was a really big theme that, that came out of today. But I'd love to hear for, for you guys um, what, what, what your themes were uh, that came out of today. I don't know that this was a the theme that came out of today, but it's an a interesting addition. Our, our entire conversation today has been focused on our emergency COVID funding for individuals. Um, but one thing we haven't really talked about is that simultaneously, we're also, to your point, Susan, also doing a fair amount of COVID funding for JOC-led organizations because they're not getting the funding from the traditional funding sources that they have, 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 are used to getting funding from. And we're, to some degree, expecting. Um, they've heard from a number of foundations, well, this isn't a priority right now. We're going to have to put you on hold because now we need to worry about COVID funding. Meanwhile, 
there's another subsect of the, of the funding community that's telling us, Alana and I, well, you know, maybe this is a time to like contract. Maybe more Jews of color organizations need to merge. And my answer is always the Jews of color field hasn't yet matured, right? Until it's sort of, and I'm not picking on the, the farming community, but until the Jews of color field looks like the farming community, i.e. there's a Jewish farming everything in every town in this country, the field is not yet built. So I think we need to understand that, that even though we're in a pandemic and even though individuals are suffering, there are a number of very vulnerable Jews of color institutions that are growing and that are appearing that are also suffering right now. I think I would add that um, the, two th the two other pieces I wanna sort of raise up are, um, I am really, really lucky to work with an incredible team of very, very smart, very strategic people in a space that is not yet to Angel's Point form. And so everything we're doing is creating new landscape upon which we're running and walking, which means that we are always thinking about the next vulnerable population. We're always understanding that what's working for Jews of color or not working for Jews of color is an opportunity to learn about other populations that are going to um, that we're going to have to think about next. And so the infrastructure that we need to build as a collective has to be flexible enough to transcend individual identities. And expansive enough to receive the wholeness of a person as they come with all their vulnerabilities. And the more diverse this country becomes, the more diverse our Jewish community becomes, the more identities every one of us will carry with us or already has, and it's time to come out with all of our identities. The other thing I want to say is this moment that um, we all get to be in together right now as colleagues learning together is the, is the result of a partnership, of deep partnership between um, the Jews of Color Initiative, the Weinberg Foundation and their wonderful work around poverty and a long relationship or a long emerging relationship that we have with that work, with the Jewish Funders Network and trusted partnerships in there, trusted partnerships in Jewish federations of North America. And so these partnerships between Jews of color led organizations and traditional um, legacy organizations, if you will, or traditional foundations, this is not about just funding. Like this is not about funding. This is about like think tanking, intellectual teamwork, infrastructural efforts, and building the pathways that can only come when people converge and think together and problem solve together. And so Angel's point is right on. Um, you know, the grants and the, 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 the scale of resources available is extremely important, or the, or the, the paucity of, of resources available to Jews of color is extremely important. In addition to that, the partnerships between all of the colleagues of color out there and those who have influence and can inform the ecosystem, they're vital. Otherwise, we're never going to be able to create the infrastructure we need for the emerging populations in the Jewish community. And I would literally just add one sentence and say and get a little bit more granular, which is not really my skill set. I'm more a strategy person, tech. The tactical pieces are not, that's not where I'm I sit, but I do think I'm gonna go there and say that this field that is in formation needs the chance to grow and be together. And I've heard, you know, Paula Pretlow has said this to me, Shoshana Brown from Black Kids Matter has said this to me. Many people have said, can we don't all even know who we, who we all are? Like this disparate, the disparate nature of like where our communities are, where our JOC leaders are, where our orgs are, where our people are, is we're everywhere which means that you know, we actually need to create, when we talk about creating this infrastructure organizationally and, and as a community, institutionally, yes, and to Angel's point, we're not done growing yet. Like what are the things that we're doing in real time to build the connective tissue amongst the JOC field, right? There's already a connective tissue that exists between all the partners that Alana just enumerated, but what about the connective tissue about the field? And so, we need to, at the initiative, we need to be able to do that work and build that connective tissue. And can we, you know, bring people together, bring this community that's growing together, um, I think would be a great step. And then also bringing them together with our institutional partners um, that we have access to and influence to and just marrying it all in service of, um, of a reflective community that serves us in the good times and the bad. 
I will let that be the last word. It's a fantastic set of messages to end on. Um, Tamar, do you want to give us our out music? Uh, I think I also want to just leave that as last word. All of you spoke so beautifully, and I just have so much gratitude for the work that you're that you're doing every day. So much gratitude that you took the time to share with us, to learn with us, and to make sure we understand what's really going on. Like like was referenced, this is really the beginning of a conversation, and I hope that we'll be able to continue this with you all as partners and the people that have attended as partners. And so hopefully to be continued. And thank you again so much for your time and your work. Have a good day, everybody. Stay well.